requires uh, crack units that we used to do a ton of computer room units that uh, would use a dry cooler that's uh, basically a coil with prop fans and fins on the coil. Uh, prop fan pulling air up through the coil to reject the heat. Uh, and the code changed to uh, basically that device had to take 100% of free cooling, right? Um, with an economizer, water side economizer coil inside at, at first it was 45 degrees, then it went up to 50. Well, that made the device get bigger and bigger and bigger until it wouldn't fit. So heat pumps have high enough uh, efficiency that they can do different things. They don't have to, uh, they have some exceptions. And so we're seeing those used a lot, and so they're using the geothermal heat. heat pumps. They're taking the heat to make the cold for the server. Yeah, they're not using the, well, they're not using the heating mode. Yeah, right. Cooling right. oil, right. <laughs> so, um, but we will use geothermal, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of dumb. I mean, there's the practical, yeah. well, there's, <laughs> there's the practical side of design, and then sometimes there's the code driven <laughs> side of design. Uh, but um, these heat pumps either come in standard conditions or geothermal conditions. And geothermal conditions are just broader. They're colder on the cold side, uh, you know, hotter on the hot side, and um, and primarily though they're they're treating the cold side, and literally it's just extra insulation and some other things in the controls of the heat pump. It's the same device. Uh, They'll just configure it for one way or the other. In fact, McQuay's stocking programs, probably much like others, that they stock just the geothermal now um, because if somebody wants a, a geothermal heat pump, they've got it. If they want a standard heat pump, they can use the geothermal. Um, makes it easier to stock one, one model. So that's kind of why they're popular, how they're used, how they work. I, I talked about the heat exchange on the condenser side, then we started talking about the field. So the, the compressor is just a pump. It's just moving uh, refrigerant from a, a cold, low pressure side to a hot, high pressure side. And the condenser is basically condensing that hot gas into a hot liquid. And it's just moving refrigerant in a circle. And the only reason we're doing it is because we're taking heat from where we don't want it, and putting it somewhere we can dump it, or we're taking heat we do want that's not useful. So even the ground at 40 degrees, that's heat. It's, it's a lot hotter than 32. <laughs> and we'll take that and we'll bump it up using the heat of compression and refrigeration cycle to make it a useful heat. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, constraints I wanted to point out. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get this in the slide. Do you want to put it on? I can, I can shine a book up on it. Yeah, that'd be great. This is uh, horizontals, <coughs> operating limits. We'll okay. just talk briefly about that. Uh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually this. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll have to get a snake around. Are you done with your, your oh, yeah. uh, point? Let me pull it. Make sure. Because I have to plug in that thing. Good. Shut that down. <coughs> seen heat pumps if you haven't vertical horizontals just look like a box look like a fan coil uh, uh, for that matter but inside there you have compressor condenser coil coaxial condenser coil an evaporator coil and a reversing valve that basically changed the process from heating to cooling and your condenser becomes the evaporator and vice versa uh, What I'm showing you here is sizes like half ton to five ton. Then they'll have bigger ones, right? And uh, these are water to air source. There's also water to water source. Show you that. 
it, this exploded drawing shows you the guts. Uh, you can see the fan. Um, again, a water source heat pump uses a water source heat pump uses a, a coaxial condenser. You can see this one's insulated with black, uh, like neoprene insulation. And uh, an air source heat pump, where you go air to air, would have a another coil and fan, much like um, an evaporator fan and coil. So you can see there's the um, evaporator fan, there's the coil, uh, piping connecting, and this is the water side condenser coil that has the tube and tube. over in the corner here where, where they're showing it installed. And it can be vertical or, or uh, I'm sorry, it can be um, up or down flow. Um, horizontal up in the overhead, hanging from structure. And then you can see they'll make them in mirror images with either straight through or end, which is a 90 degree air path. And that's pretty industry standard. Uh, let's see, there are some other uh, heat pumps worth mentioning. Well, look, my icons jumped around. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like this fancy Microsoft signature computer is right. giving me fits. So, uh, all big manufacturers have line cards. You can see here, um, this is McQuay's. Dyke McQuay, as it's presently known. You can see there's uh, unit ventilators. You see those in classrooms a lot. Uh, package terminal air conditioners. You know, these are the real simple units where our contractor says, oh, it's about a half a ton. And you'll see a lot in hotels, you know, you know drive up hotels like a motel, um, <laughs> VAD products, um, coils, air handlers, chillers, water-cooled chillers, air-cooled chillers, uh, condensing units, fluid coolers, temperature amplifiers, here a whole suite of air handling products, and then water source heat pumps. And McQuay does not have air-to-air -air heat pumps. Uh, we represent a line called United Cool Air that does that. Um, water source is much more common. Air source is very expensive and very large now to meet code. It used to be very popular. But water source is where uh, you get very high efficiencies and the code likes water source. The energy code is written to promote water source heat pumps and the like. This is a, uh, a rooftop version of a water source heat pump. They have stacked versions, like a high-rise, oh, right here, much like a fan coil unit. Again, the fan coil products look similar to water source heat pumps. The difference is this is chilled water, and this is water to a refrigerant to an air exchange, whereas this is just water to air exchange. And uh, there's water to water uh, heat pumps, too. So. You might see that where they're trying to um, take ground source water and heat it up to you know, useful temperature like 120, 140 degrees for process heat. You know, maybe it's for a big kitchen, a commercial kitchen, or, or BAV boxes like this one over here with a water plug. Okay. That's probably what we'll have to do for our new labs. I don't think we'll be able to deal with it, but you pump on it, I think we'll have to put a water source on it. So I'm going into the, the <laughs> program now, and we'll do a selection, and we'll just use a horizontal. You guys want and to call it the data? data, data. Great. Oh, and we're going to bring this up, right? So yeah, you can move. If you can, yeah. oh yeah, okay, so you have to have this. Have to have if you don't need this right now, you can... I'll just read it. Okay. 
right, I'll just walk around with it. <coughs> so in the typical catalog for any of the manufacturers, you're going to have um, operating limits. And I'll just mention a, a few of them. So there's air side limits and there's water side limits. And heat pumps, any kind of refrigeration cycle, the, the equipment is ignorant. It just knows it doesn't want low pressure, it doesn't want high pressure, okay? And those are associated with temperatures and, and so low pressure, low temperature, high pressure, high temperature. And to keep it in those boundaries, heat pumps, like other equipment, is designed to not have a lot of variance in airflow and temperatures. So you're not varying, you know, if a heat pump's designed for 1200 CFM, you're not going to try to change the speed of the fan to 400 CFM. You're going to go off on a low pressure trip. You're going to be running out to a job site at 125 bucks an hour, drive time included. <laughs> Next thing you know. So these things are designed to operate effectively without any issues. And when they do trip, it's usually because it's being operated incorrectly. Uh, oftentimes, though, you know, as they get older, it'll be because a component fails. But uh, they're also equipped with um, indicator lights, uh, so you can figure out right away what you got, what the problem is. And they've been built for decades, and over that time, they built them in a way so that customers, contractors, and users can figure out what's going on, can fix them quickly. But again, they're designed not to have a lot of variation, so they are bulletproof. And back to that bulletproof comment, you got your limitations. And on a geothermal range, on the air side, you have like five criteria. Minimum ambient air, uh, normal ambient air, maximum ambient air, uh, minimum uh, entering, uh, entering air, normal entering air, dry bulb and wet bulb, and maximum in air, dry bulb and wet bulb. So min and max refers to transient conditions. Uh, normal is once it's up and steady running, uh, middle of the day, whatever, uh, and you're not getting uh, in either a, a transient start condition or something you know odd. Um, that's what normal conditions are. So normal conditions for a geothermal entering air 8067, cooling 70 degrees heating. A maximum would be 183 on the cooling, uh, dry and wet bulb, and 80 degrees on the heating. For minimum ambient air and cooling, it's 40 degrees, and heating, it's, it's 40 degrees. And max ambient air is 100 degrees for cooling and 85 for heating. So the temperature of the plenum, if it's a horizontal unit up in the plenum. Um, water side conditions, minimum entering air, um, cooling 30 degrees, heating 20, normal is 77 and 40, and max would be 110 and 90. So you got to keep these things in mind as you're doing your systems to prevent your, uh, your heat pumps from tripping uh, in the field. And again, they're not, they're not smart devices. They're meant to operate within a range, and that's where we have to be smart enough to design in a system that, you know, 8,760 8, 8, hours a year that it's, we've considered every kind of condition it can operate in. And we're not outside those ranges. So. Yeah, I, I goofed up yesterday when I was telling you about the uh, return air. So that's in the entering air temperature? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, we'll use those conditions, okay? Because it actually has to take up some of the heat of the space, you know. And that's on the cooling, not on the, on the cooling heating, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. So, <laughs> see, no problem. So what, uh, what kind of tonnage are we looking for in the first direction? Well, let me start with, with Nick. He's got, he's got three heat pumps for his job. Uh, so uh, we, uh, yeah, why don't you talk? What do you got? You got 450 CFM. First one. Uh, okay, so that's probably about a ton and a half. Yeah, you can if you want to read this your your cooling capacity. That's that's what he was sort of asking for. If you've got you have that down. <coughs> okay. 
trying to think of all these numbers and we're not thinking it creatively, it bogs us down. That's why engineers have made all these benchmarks, uh, you know, what a, what a therm is, you know, what a, what a watt is, uh, um, you know, um, what a ton is. Why did they make a ton? Well, somebody decided that was how it was going to be to make it simple. It could have been something else. It could have been 11,000 BTUs, but it's 12,000. And it, it, helps us, <laughs> it helps us all to work very quickly without getting bogged down in numbers. So, yeah, rounder numbers better. So, what was you said? It was 40? 40, yes. Okay. And it was 520 CFM for that one. Okay. Um, we'll see if that ends up matching up, too. It probably will. <laughs> yeah. What was What did you say, 550 CFM? 520. 520. So, again, in, like any equipment, there's going to be fixed sizes. And you can see here we've got, you've got sizes ranging in the small tonnage um, units from 7, 9, 12, 15, 19, 24, 36, 42, 48, 60, 70, 72, and 96. Now, I picked 42 because you'd said 40. And you can see software, they'll, they'll give you all kinds of warnings, uh, reps like myself, to stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Because there's folks with a lot of gray hair like me that know <laughs> a lot about all this equipment. And there's other guys that are new and just dumb enough to let the computer decide what, what they're going to buy. So they put as many warnings and, uh, and safeties that don't allow you to make a selection if you're out of range. So we're outside the recommended air flow range on a, on a size 42. Um, and you can see right here, the recommended range is 1120 to 2130 with the nominal at about 1400. So 42 MDH is about three and a half tons. And you'll have anywhere between three to 450 um, CFM per ton. Typically it's just under 400. So that's why you get that number about 1400 CFM as a nominal number. So what this actually means is that you're going to need to make your cooling capacity match these CFM. So let's put in 1400. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Actually, you know what you wanted less. So we're going to put in, uh, I think it's at 1150 would give us a selection. And then fluid flows. Um, the programs will put in, uh, they'll populate these fields based on the size unit you pick. And then it's your job to decide, you know, whether you're going up or down and uh, to enter uh, the operating conditions. Um, you also have voltage and refrigerant type. Of course, I already selected R410. That's what you're going to see in you know, 90% of your applications. Our 407C was a stopgap refrigerant. It has, it's a blend. It has a lot of what they call glide, which makes for unpredictable operation and inefficiency. And R410 is very little, even though it's a blend. Um, R410 has replaced R22 because of its um, properties, its green properties. Uh, 
uh, you know, ozone depletion um, and uh, efficiencies. And um, the other refrigerant you'll see a lot of is R134A. That's used on centrifugal uh, chillers and a lot of screw chillers. Um, so R410, uh, whatever your voltage, what is your voltage? Uh, we can just play like it's a two inch job. Okay. Um, <coughs> important to know that in, in a lot of software, a lot of uh, equipment, you may not have every voltage you ever wanted for each piece of equipment. Um, small stuff won't have three phase. Big stuff won't offer single phase. And then depending on you know how big the motor is, um, you may not be able to get smaller voltages. Uh, small volts, big amps. Big volts, small amps. So you got to know what's available when you're selecting. Here's what's available here. We'll just leave it as. Sorry, Dave. You want three phase? Or yeah. Two? So that means three phase, 60 hertz. Is that what yeah. that? It's all 60 hertz. Yeah, in the I'm United just States. Making sure that I know what those. Yeah. Uh, Europe's 50, and uh, what's Canada? Like 60. 60 as well. Yeah, that's right. But they'll do different voltages. They'll do 575 yeah, do stuff like that. And yeah. <coughs> so here on the blower motor, and you'll see everyone has an option for a standard or an ECM. <coughs> standard is a PSC motor, and a ECM motor is electric commutated motor, and it is it's got a basically a, a computer in it and it acts like a VFD and it's very efficient and so it's very efficient and it'll also find its CFM even as uh, pressures in the system change. So if you have a, a filter that's loading up on this heat pump and that makes for a larger pressure drop in the old PSC motors the fan would just ride the fan curve. So that means that um, more pressure, less CFM. That's not good for a heat pump. Or the occupants, you want the same CFM. We're doing constant flow in this design, constant air flow and varying temperature. <coughs> the ECM motor will adjust its speed to find that CFM because it has mapped points in this microprocessor. And so as the pressure increases, uh, it will speed up the motor to find that CFM at a new point. Whereas a PSC will not. Uh, I, I miss I miss part of that. Does it that that goes against like filter static? Is that what it's for? It, that's one of the great advantages okay. is that uh, before you'd have to do a VFD with a pressure uh, transducer across the filter bank. So as it loads up, you'd have to give a signal feedback signal to the VFD to speed up, right? Because it's uh, it's either you're either doing it with an airflow measuring device or a pressure difference. Um, that's pretty new, right? And EC, mot EC motors are, uh, actually they're 10 years-ish. They've been around quite a bit yeah, in VAV boxes. Uh, it started in VAV boxes, uh, and GE had uh, the first one, had the patent. Uh, Beloit bought them. And, um, and then they were also in uh, residential furnaces and high-end uh, uh, heating and cooling um, air handlers. Uh, residential. Now they're they're going all across the market, and that means they're getting into bigger motors. Well, that's a very expensive device to get into the market when they are on the VAV boxes, which are all fractional horsepower, one horse and, and down. Um, we would be paying new. We'd be paying about 400 bucks for that motor and uh, parts would be like 600, now it's half the price. So as it